Great. Uh, so I would like to start. I won't start with AI, actually. Let's leave that for a bit later. But AI related, I'm not talking specifically about it. But, you know, this year's theme, we're talking about sources. And you must have seen uh, what's been happening, what may be coming in terms of a, of a, of a change of technology, of a ways of actually using information as source that's not necessarily quite common now happening to data, for instance, we've seen some of that. But what, what, what are you seeing when you look out there and you talk uh, technology and the future forecasting and so on? What can you see that could become great tools in a newsroom? Well, I think one of the things to start with is to say that as good journalists, and I know that we're good journalists in this room, um, we always double source things. We always like to check our sources, and that's never been more important. There is so much out there to trip us up and to get us thinking about um, uh, you know, d different ways of looking at the world. Um, I've been looking at a lot of Twitter recently with people saying, oh, you know, we're in the post-truth era. There are no facts. Well, we know as journalists that there are facts. And I think making sure that we're very meticulous about working out what those ground truths and what those facts are, however we choose to do that, is, is literally simply the most important thing that we have to do at the moment. And there are lots of tools to help with that. And there are lots of things that are happening in the technology world that are making that harder. So, you know, we're kind of faced with this, uh, the, 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 the rising tide is raising all those boats at once. And we need to think really carefully about how we, how we exist in this new era and how we make sure that we're very questioning about what we're seeing, but also that we're using this wealth of data that we're getting, which is, is like nothing we've ever seen before, to tell new stories and to generate new content because it would be criminal not to. Um, there, there is a, an amazing array of tools, and I'm thinking, you know, artificial intelligence being one of them, or certainly machine learning being one of them, um, that can that can take material which would have taken a human journalist a hundred years to try to digest and and turn it into really interesting insights which we can use in our journalism. So I think it's it, it, there's never been a more exciting time in terms of technology and data to be in journalism. We just need to make sure that we're equipped for it and that we we know how to use these tools and how to question what we're seeing. You mentioned uh, in artificial intelligence. It's the talk of the town at the moment. It's the, it's the big topic. Newsrooms very worried. Journalists very worried. Lots of people very worried about uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I have the feeling that uh, you are not quite in a, in a overly worried camp. Uh, you see some opportunities as well. What can you see AI doing in a newsroom for good? Yeah, it's been a, fa a fascinating week. I think everybody's trying to find a, a phrase to describe the, the doomers and the other people who are not doomers. So I, I don't know if you've noticed, but there are kind of there are two or three godfathers of AI that are kind of coming out and speaking um, on behalf of one side or another. I think we're calling them the doomers and the palmers at the moment because uh, one of them, um, Meta's Jan McCun, is, is saying that he he face palms every time he sees another um, doom laden prophecy about what AI is going to do to us as a society. Um, so, so newsrooms, uh, uh, one of the most fascinating things I've seen so far is using this new ability we have to um, to source and to analyze information to give us a head start on some of the more complicated investigations that we might be undertaking. So, I mean, Lucia, you've probably done the same as I have, been given a story to look at and sat looking at a blank page and thought, I've no idea where I go with this story. I've never investigated, you know, farming in this particular region or, you know, whatever it is that, you know, as a journalist, you have thrown at you if you're not a specialist, particularly. And this gives you a, an ability to, 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 we could always do it through Google, but this is much cleverer. You can ask um, something like ChatGPT, where would you go with this investigation? Now, bearing in mind that we all know we have to question what it gives us and be very careful that it's not lying to us it's not telling us uh you know false information because it is designed to occasionally do that it, it can just spark ideas so i think as an ideas generator either around an investigation or perhaps even about a story i've sat there and tried to write a paper or a document and thought blank page freeze what shall i do and it will just help you start that process 
one of the criticisms that I often um, get around that is, well, won't it turn us into boring journalists? We'll just rely on this. We'll never think of our own, you know, beautiful prose again. I don't think that is the case. I think using it as a tool uh, just to kind of jog you, it's just like brainstorming. It's like brainstorming with another person. Um, so I think there's a, there's real potential to, to enable it to let us be creative with both our thinking and our writing and the courses that we follow in in with regards to our, our journalism and our investigations. Okay, you talked about, I can say that's a compelling case, but you talked about as well the risk of uh, fake uh, or being being effectively uh, taken for a ride by, by some AI tools as well. Uh, are there tools coming up there? Because I think that's one of the biggest concerns. And the moment AI allows or the technology moves and you have the deep fake getting better and better, uh, some of the things you may try to find actually may not be true in the first place, but looks very much like the, the true story or the true information. Is there enough being developed as well to counter that, to help newsrooms, journalists to effectively spot the fake? It's a really tricky area. So there's been, there have been attempts. So I don't know if you heard of something called Chat GPT um, Zero or GPT Zero, which was a an attempt to try and spot, you know, what was generated text. The trouble is, this very quickly becomes an arms race, and these systems get cleverer and cleverer. And I think one of the other interesting things, particularly for journalists, is the work that's being done around trying to and this this is anthropomorphizing these tools in a way that i feel quite uncomfortable with but it, it's a convenient shortcut so stopping them lying as much to us <laughs> so you know making sure that um there's, there's a particular there's a particular thing that happened last week where the training of these models is being adjusted so that they get rewarded better in the process of delivering the information rather than just with the end result and the tendency for that allegedly is to give us um slightly better results when it comes to not hallucinating and they call it hallucinating which again is a very human term uh which doesn't feel right um but there are attempts to 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 make these um these models more honest there are attempts to get us to be able to spot what's going on better but deep fake detection when it came to images was never a very exact science in fact it was a very inexact science and still is in in many cases um and i think we we do have to rely um very much on humans in the loop and making sure that we're checking and that we're using our own brains on, on, on this as well, because I, I'm not sure the machines are ever going to completely solve this for us. Because you, you, you talked about the images and uh, perhaps the image is the most, is the most worrying one. Um, and you, you're raising a really good point. I mean, even out of experience for, for us, uh, poor humans, uh, that you know, whenever you do a search on Google, text is quite, it's a lot better than uh, 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 an image. Uh, search. Uh, the image search throws all sorts of weird things in the middle. So clearly images still is a problem. But are there are there ways that the industry is looking into the kind of, um, I don't know, uh, watermark, some kind of a thing that would allow, allow at least to give a bit of uh, where this comes from and they'll be able to find more information as a way of trying to tackle at least the responsible providers of content are able to show that that's the real thing. Well, you have me, Lucy, on my pet subject now, which is media provenance, and um, it has a name. Uh, yeah, of, you know, I, I, I've been working on this um, with the BBC and others for about four years now, and uh, I don't think it's ever felt more important. So putting signals into content that enable you to see whether they have come from uh, a trusted source, a source that you choose to trust. We're not making any judgment on who you choose to trust, but from the source that you have chosen to trust and making sure that you know what has been done to that content um, and, and whether it's been altered on the way to it to you is is really important and we've been working with a lot of people in this field in in, in what we call the media provenance field um so so big names such as microsoft um we have um, adobe we have the new york times we have the canadian broadcasting uh corporation radio canada and the idea is that we we pull together to uh, make sure that the signals that you put in content uh, can reliably be tracked through that content wherever it goes in the media ecosystem. And obviously, a lot of that is onto social media. Um, the difference between that and what you might traditionally have seen as watermarking or fingerprinting is that these signals are immutable. They, they, they stick with the content wherever it goes and whatever you do to it. So if you process it and shrink it and you know resize it and do all the things that are quite legitimate, and then potentially some things that are a bit, a bit more 
changing of that content. So, you know, if you do other things with it, you can track those changes um, and see what's happened to a piece of content. And this is so important to us. And I, I know that a lot of journalistic organizations feel the same way. Transparency about how you've acquired a story, what you've done to it, where you've got that image from, what you've done to that image is is such a big deal at the moment. And research that we've done particularly shows that younger audiences feel it very strongly. They want to know well, who's the creator, where's it come from, what's happened to it. And I think that's hugely encouraging, um, but it's also a challenge. And this work is just starting to get out and be felt in the industry. And we really hope that will continue and that will be something which becomes an absolutely accepted part of what we do within a, a reasonably short time. One of the big questions is who developed this stuff? You know, what is behind it? What's the bias? What is, I mean, when we use chat uh, GPT, I don't know where the sources are, who are the sources, what it started from, and what is the coding behind it? Is there a push? Is there a work, in, in, including, I don't know, I know you work not only in the BBC, but you work with uh, with partners all over the world trying to, to make technology and AI a better place, so to speak. Um, uh, is there is there a kind of a set of uh, principles being agreed in terms of uh, the most ethical and appropriate way of uh, ensuring there is transparency in uh, AI tools? It's a very hard thing to do. So one of the things that, that, that really defines this kind of technology is that there is this, this black box that we describe in the middle of it. So it is quite hard to work out how these neural networks that drive generative AI are working and what they're doing to come to the conclusions that they come to. Um, at its simplest, ChatGPT or something along those lines is simply predicting the next word and you are setting it up so that it, there's some randomness in there, but uh, so it isn't always coming out with the same thing. Um, but but it is, it is selecting the next word. And it's doing that, having been trained on a, a series of databases, very big databases. There was a wonderful piece in the um, in one of the American newspapers. I can't remember which one it was. It was either the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post. And it was uh, about one of these databases and what was in there. And this was like really lifting the lid on something which so, so few of us have ever had a chance to kind of really look at. Um, and some of the stuff that, you know, went into this gigantic database, it was Google C4 database, um, was quite surprising. Lots of blogs, lots of personal blogs, lots of things like I think Wikipedia and things that you might expect. And then some slightly odd stuff that, you know, was quite unexpected and maybe in some cases a little bit worrying. So um, it's essentially training on a big chunk of the internet. And, you know, that that's something which is a wonderful place and also a terrible place at the same time. Um, so so that with those two things in mind, the kind of black box nature of what's going on and these vast data sets uh, some of which we know about and with some models we don't we don't know what they're being trained on um it, it gives us a level of just real lack of knowledge about what might come out and a lack of understanding about how things are going to be uh, concluded or output by these models that is something which i think feels quite uncomfortable to live with um some people are saying you know we need to we need to build these models again from the ground up and really understand them better. I'm not sure that's ever going to be completely possible, um, but certainly what we can do is get our arms around the data they're being trained with and, and have a better understanding and appreciation of where that's coming from and what the biases are that it brings with it. And also there's a possibility that you can develop uh, other, I mean, we, 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 are, we are going right now through a major a major issue over Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we know from our times in BBC monitoring as well that Russia has been particularly efficient uh, and uh, and uh, invested a lot on uh, alternative facts uh, and propaganda through some in some cases quite sophisticated methods to to put a different story out there. We may end up with a kind of a different databases in different parts of the world telling different stories. No. And, and also, you, you know, you can tr you can train them in different ways. So there's something called Freedom GPT, which is designed to be um, they won't call it this, but a, a, a more right wing version. So it doesn't hide any of the truths that, you know, um, other more responsible models, in our view, m might. There are no guardrails. It will give you the recipe for napalm. It will tell you how to build a bomb. It will give you, you know, a, a, sl a slightly different um, appreciation of the world, should we say. Um, and that will continue. That will be the first of many. You know, it, it, it seems almost odd to 
think of of these models which feel quite agnostic um m- mostly to start with suddenly kind of developing these personalities but that's exactly what you know what alignment does does to them and training uh it it, pu- it puts in that you know that extra dimension of of what you want these things to say because you can actually you know steer that and take away um uh take away inhibitions um uh, or add in filters so yeah, we're still in sort of a reasonably early stage with this technology, but it's only going to get more interesting um, and potentially more more worrying, I guess. Uh, we talked about a few worrying things and uh, you raised a few important points that need to be sorted out. But you still seem to be fairly optimistic about all this. Why? Uh, I think the regulatory field is starting to really sort of uh, grip this and understand it. And we're starting to see um, how regulation might potentially be um, be powerful in this space. I also think that, um, you know, although you listen to uh, some of the people that have invented this technology, and I, I think particularly always hear of Sam Altman from uh, OpenAI, who created ChatGPT and um, well, whose company certainly created ChatGPT and also Dali, um, you hear him speak and he appears to want regulation he appears to want you know this to be a safe a safe place although some people would kind of question the wisdom of of pushing these these things out onto the market without you know perhaps a, a, as much oversight as they might have had um so i i i do think i i have a i have a fundamental this sounds very grand but a fundamental basic faith in humanity where have I got that from? Uh, you know, that, that means that I think um, I think we can sort that out. We, you know, we can sort it out. We can make it work. And they're such special tools that, you know, I, 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 I want to have faith in them because when you look at the good side and you look at how these are real instruments of levelling up, these help, you know, people that don't have brilliant literacy to write letters of advocacy or things they might want to do in a much better way. They help people run their businesses. They help people generate ideas. Of course, we're going to have to think about how we flex the workforce when it comes to some of the things that perhaps humans do that these machines might take over. But they are a fascinating piece of human endeavor, and I'd like to think we could use them for good. Well, Laura, uh, continuing with the, with the optimism, um, it, given all you know and all you are coming to know, um, what would advice, what would be the advice, what would be the suggestions that... Uh, 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 the Laura today would give to Laura starting for the first time in a newsroom? I would definitely say um, get acquainted with as much technology as you can. Technology is never not going to be a part of the journalist's um, lifestyle now. Um, I did a course in machine learning and it made me cry with anxiety and pain because I'm not very good at maths, but I thought I've got to learn it. I've got to go through this. I've got to understand it. And I'm now about to do another one. There's some very good courses that you can do. So some of them are free at the moment in, in generative AI and just pick up those skills, use the tools. We all know that our, our, our organizations and our companies are, are anxious about how we use them. So make sure you're sticking within those regulations and guidelines. You don't want to be upsetting your organization by putting a load of data into a tool that shouldn't be there but use these tools um get to know them get to work out what they what they do and i'd also say start off by asking these tools if you're looking at chat gpt for example ask it about something you know about and then you'll get a real sense of its capabilities because if you are asking it about something you already know about you can see where the gaps are and you will become more cautious appropriately cautious about things perhaps that you don't know about so i'd say do that i'd say you know with journalists we always like being ahead of the game it's what we it's what we are it's what we do it's who we are uh so why not you know be ahead of the game on this be the one who gets it in the newsroom be the one who can use it be the one who tries it out and finds new use cases for it um be cautious be careful be responsible but you know have these conversations it's a very special time to be alive in the tech world and um for all the kind of you know difficulties and dangers we should try it and enjoy it and benefit from it as much as we can. Thank you.